Uh, my name is Tim Campos. Uh, I am the Associate Vice President of Admissions here at Art Center College of Design. My pronouns are he, him, and thank you for being with us. Maybe for some of you, this is your first time uh, in our Dialogue and Diversity and Design Speaker Series, or for some of you, you're probably returning, which is great. Um, this particular spring series, um, it's a coast in collaboration with the Center for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Art Center Admissions, including a variety of co-sponsors and hosts as well. And so for the spring series, we're actually going to be focusing on arts and our alumni who are working in various creative fields within entertainment. So uh, to get us started uh, this evening, we are spotlighting Philip Burroughs Jr., who graduated in 2019 with a Bachelor of Science uh, in Entertainment Design, specifically concept. Um, so I'll turn it over to Philip in just a second, but I want to go ahead and uh, turn it over to my colleagues from the Center for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the library to introduce themselves as well. Thanks, Tim. I'll go, I'll go first. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen Butler. I'm, I work for the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Department. My title is a Creative Operations Manager. I'm also an Art Center alum, a 2013 film, and super excited for this series this term and, and to get it started with uh, Philip. But uh, I'll pass it off to our colleagues in the library. Hi, I'm Jennifer Feist, and I work in the library. I'm the Director of Collections and Systems, and I had the pleasure of working with Philip while he was a student at Art Center. Hi, my name is Maria. I'm also from the library, and I work next door to Jennifer's office, so I also had the pleasure of uh, seeing Philip as he spent time in the library. Thanks so much. We, lo we love our, our librarians. And thank you again to my colleagues in the Center for Diversity and Inclusion, the Arts Center Library, and also the Entertainment Design Department, who all co-sponsor tonight's event with Philip. So uh, once again, we'll have, a, we'll have Philip uh, kind of run through and give us a presentation, uh, tell us a little bit more about himself and his journey. And then we'll have uh, some time where we have some questions for him. And then we'll open it up to the audience as well. Uh, as a reminder, this event is being recorded. So there'll be an opportunity. I know sometimes people have to run uh, and that's perfectly fine. We'll be able to uh, share this post the event as well. So without further ado, let me hand it over officially to uh, Philip Burroughs Jr., who is a graduate from the 2019 Entertainment Design and is currently a background designer at Green Portal Productions, AKA Rick and Morty. Philip. Hey, hey, let me uh, share my screen really quickly. First off, hello everyone, thank you for coming. Thank you for making the time to come and see me and listen to me talk. We probably spread some gibberish. Um, but like Tim was saying, uh, my name is Philip Burroughs Jr. Uh, I'm a background designer at uh, Green Porter Productions and I'm working on Rick and Morty. Um, I've been here since, I think the end of 2020, um, I started off as a cleanup artist and then I moved up to a background designer towards the beginning of 2021, uh, starting at the tail end of season five and now we're working on season six. Um, and super excited for you guys to see everything we have to come. Uh, so a little bit about me. I'm from Brownsville, Miami, Florida. Uh, and um, these are my parents. This is my mom who could probably part time as a comedian if she wanted to. And my dad who's probably the coolest guy on the planet. Uh, and not like the corny cool, like cool, cool. Uh, trust me when I say that. Um, and um, being from um, Miami, Florida, um, I think it's kind of like important for me to kind of like spotlight, not just uh, my immediate family, but also my extended family because I'm an only child, so I don't have any siblings, but I was never without um, people that I can rely on and trust uh, to kind of uplift me and push me to do and be the best version of myself. Um, and when I couldn't call anyone brother or sister, I found people that can be kind of like, my extended brothers or extended family, and I still consider them my brothers and sisters. And I don't think I would have started this journey into art without them. Because originally when I started drawing, I started drawing by just tracing coloring books. Uh, and, my, um, and I'd always hide it, I'd kind of like lie about it. And my cousins would always call me out, they'll be like, no, you traced that, you couldn't draw that, you're not good enough to draw like that or whatever, whatever. And then I got to a point where I was just like, you know what, I'm gonna stop tracing. I'm going to stop 
I'm going to prove them wrong. I'm going to show them that I can draw. Uh, and that's kind of what led me to start, or that's more like kind of like the prologue of my art journey, if I'm being completely honest, because still at that time, I didn't know what art was. I was in middle school telling all of my family members that I wanted to be an architect because that was the most, the most sophisticated sounding um, occupation to go along with art because I knew it from uh, my big brother being an architect. So I was just like, you know what? This is kind of like my buzzword for art. Whenever someone asks me what I want to do, I'll just say architect. Then I found out what an architect was and I was just like, maybe not, I'm very much, not that much interested in drafting and all the different kind of like uh, complexities that come with being an architect. Um, but if I had to think of the first chapter of my art journey, I'd say it started with design and architecture uh, senior high. Um, that was the high school I went to and my middle school art teacher um, at the time is McHenry. Um, she's the one that kind of put me onto this place and let me know like um, the options that I had as someone that had a little bit of potential with drawing. It's just like she saw my line quality because I was, I was kind of just like copying comic books and things that are lying heavy at the time. And she was just like, hey, is this for fun or is this for real? And I was just like, I don't know. And she was like, make a decision because I see some potential in you. And if you want to do this, I, I can make it so you can. You can make it so you can. And so she basically taught me the, the fundamentals, the language of art and told me like the possibilities that I can, um, that I had there's New World and there was there was Dash at the time. And I was more interested in like cool, edgy, like like line work and all these different kind of like um, different um, super extra designy things where New World was more of a school that was about fine art and kind of like abstraction and all these different ways of thinking when it comes to visual art. So I built a portfolio with her help. Um, I filled up multiple sketchbooks. I, I don't remember how many sketchbooks. I was just kind of like grinding art at the time. I put the multiple sketchbooks and then I applied and I got in. And that's when I started to kind of like um, really like absorb every single piece of information when it came to art. Like it was it was like a whole new world open to me because I didn't I never really thought about what I wanted to be when I grew up when I was a kid. I never had like a thing that I really, really wanted to do. I was just kind of like trying to make good grades and not have my mom like kind of like yelling at me and all, all that type of stuff. But when I went to Dash and they were, they were showing me all these different types of artists, all these different types of things, it kind of opened my mind to really the, the possibilities. Because when you go to Dash in your first year, I don't know if it's still like this, but in your first year, um, they give you kind of like a sampler, of multiple different design practices. You go through fashion, you go through graphic design you go through film and you get a taste of all the different um, options that you have. And then they ask you to pick one. And for me, I picked industrial design. Um, and that industrial design is basically um, product transportation design, um, the, the design of, I don't know how to put this, but the design of kind of like everyday objects almost. Um, and there I kind of learned how to think abstractly about design or maybe not abstractly. I learned how to think functionally about design. I started learning how to think logically about art and that's not something that I normally associated with it. But at the same time, they were grinding us for like um, fine art theory and like illustration theory. So it was a pretty intense time there where I had to kind of like come to grips with different types of artistic thinking. Um, and towards the tail end of my time at Dash, I realized I didn't want to be an industrial designer. It's like I had acquired all these skills over three years after being kind of like, uh, like grinded by my teacher, Ms. K, Ms. Kwiatkowski, who's just an amazing instructor. And I kind of received her teaching method really well because I was used to it. My mom's a PE coach, so she was like very, very tenacious. And Ms. K had the exact same qualities. If you've ever like, if you ever been in a sport, uh, played any sports, um, and um, and have kind of like experienced that level of intensity and that, that grind, you you kind of know what I'm talking about. 
because as artists, we get a certain level of intensity, but we don't really, we don't really get the level of someone like screaming in your ear all the time and telling you that like when you want to break, you have to keep going. And that's something that Miss K did. When I wanted to break, she pushed me to keep going. And I did. And it almost to a fault because she wanted me to go into product design when I apply, I eventually applied to Art Center, but I ended up applying to industrial design, I mean entertainment design because that's what I really wanted. But let's wind back a bit. Before I got to Art Center, um, I think a year before it's time for me to apply, I was in my junior year, I um I was looking for a bunch of like kind of like summer programs. It's like for the time in between uh, semesters. Um, and I didn't think I was going to get into any, but I actually got into two, the Marie Sharp program, which is more for fine art, and the IEA um, Institute for Educational Advancement program at, um, that I think is like kind of like sponsored by Art Center, but they had like an inter uh, industrial design section that I participated in, where I met a bunch of different people from uh, around the country and around the world and uh, I met another great and intense teacher named Stan Kong, who grinded me into the ground one, one more time. And it wouldn't be the last because then I still had to go to Art Center and I had to learn that Stan Kong is, is harder on his grad students than he, are on, than he is on his kids. But after IEA and after kind of like um, understanding what I wanted to do and kind of putting my foot down and, and, and taking my own path, I got to Art Center. And the script got flipped so quickly because for four years I was learning design based on function. And now I had to switch to learn entertainment design where your design is motivated by something completely different. Um, you're not asking the same questions. Um, and then uh, one of my teachers, uh, Thomas Zinteno actually, uh, he just said that to me outright. And I'm pretty sure he meant like, yo, this, this kind of sucks, but <laughs> I took it literally. I was just like, you're not asking the right question. I'm not asking the right questions. All right, cool. Uh, let me see how I can think about this differently. And what I grew to understand in my first term at Art Center is that um, I have to replace function with emotion to do to 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 basically have the the same results or yield the same results as an entertainment designer um, that I was um, that I had as an industrial designer. Instead of form follows function, I think it's form follows emotion. Um, and that's something that I kind of like, I, I, I may have taken a little bit too far because we had an assignment where we were supposed to like kind of like draw based on music and music is a huge part of my life. So I felt really connected to this assignment. It's like you basically aren't looking at the paper or anything like that, or you're, you're, not, um, you're not trying to draw anything objective. You're basically trying to trans, transmit what you're hearing on the page. And it's an ex exercise that I love to do. And in my apartment, I actually took it from the little eight, eight and a half by 11 pages that we were doing. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm doing these in charcoal on 18 by 24, because I want to have a lot of fun. And I was blasting music downstairs in my apartment at the time. And I was like creating these big charcoal drawings. And I was just basically taking motifs from those charcoal drawings and using them as design elements. And that's what this page is basically showing. Uh, this page is how I translated uh, Tori Moy's Harm and Change um, to a visual. And that's something that's really, really interesting. And it honestly changed my entire uh, way of experiencing art, honestly. Um, and these are more pages where it's like my whole design process had become about how can I take emotion and movement and all of these abstract things and turn them into something tangible and turn them into shapes and turn them into to faces and then how can I use structure or tradition to inform that and in this page um, I had uh, for this assignment I had to design um, uh, two characters from the music that I heard that I was listening to and one was a boxer and one was a dancer and they were siblings and I basically took the movements from what they did. So for the boxer, I would take the boxing movements and I would abstract them. And I would use those abstract shapes to design that character. And for the dancer, I did the same. I drew it as, represent as representationally as I could. And then I kept breaking it down until it was just raw shapes. And I used those shapes 
to inform how I designed the head of this character. And I, I really like the result. Um, and I also added a bit of uh, uh, Renoir uh, at the bottom because uh, that was basically the time period I wanted to kind of like channel as well. And I saw one of his paintings um, that basically reflected the same shape that I wanted, the shape of the eyes there. And so after that, and after under, understanding that about what I was doing, I, I had multiple different kind of like, I would say um, shifts or schisms, I would say. Um, everyone has like, like generally has a great uh, a breakout piece uh, as an artist, there's going to be a piece that makes everything click for you. And then your growth, your growth, your artistic growth, that's like kind of like very, very like shallow um, is going to just exponentially like heighten. It's like once something clicks in your head that says, wait, I get this where well, you didn't get it before. That's when you kind of like grow super, super quickly. And that's, that's kind of what happened to me with these two pieces. I was taking a digital um, plein air painting class with Shay Schatz, great teacher, um, cool guy. Um, and I was having a tough time because I was never really a painter. I always just love line. To this day, I love line. But then I had to, I learned in this class or in being like, like doing my own stubborn way of painting that a lot of my friends didn't really like. I had uh, my friend Chris was just like, dude, you can just kind of like smooth out that background and look so good. And I'm just like, no, it looks so much better uh, uh, without a gradient there. It just looks so much better just with the strokes um, because I just like to see the strokes. I like to see the lines. Uh, and when I learned that I didn't have to abandon line to paint, everything just started to kind of like come together for me. And I really, really love these pieces for that reason. Um, but yeah, um, and these two pieces or these multiple pieces were from a color theory class uh, with Richard Keyes, I believe. Um, and this is another class where I feel like I kind of like struggled with because again, I wasn't a painter and we were going on and on and on about color. Uh, where I just wanted to draw. Uh, but Richard Keyes really, really put it and um, put it in perspective for me uh, and broke, broke down what color was, how it worked, uh, and how I can utilize it in a very, very functional way rather than a very kind of like emotive, um, instinctual way, because a lot of painters are very, very instinctual when it comes to the way that they paint. Oh, yeah. Uh, this slide may can contain a little gore. If anyone's kind of like queasy, doesn't like seeing that stuff, please cover your eyes for a little moment. Um, after that, I took um, Justine Parrish's fashion design class where she gave me another framework to understand abstractness in a, func in a functional way. And it helped me out so much. Uh, and it, well, putting together mood boards helped me out so much because I can take all the weirdest things in my head, put it together, and I could just pull from it. I could just pull from it. I didn't have to do the extra work of inventing things. It's all just right there. And for this project in particular, um, it wasn't what I did for school. I took the skills I learned in her class and I did a personal project just to kind of like flex that and see if I can like um, design a serial killer by using the same process. And this is a piece that I really love for my uh, for my graduation, uh, just because of just like what it represents as being like kind of like uh, I guess as being like a black man because uh, I don't know why I was so connected to it, but I was just like, dang, this guy's battered and bruised. This character who has a, a a whole backstory that unfortunately, like when you're in entertainment design, um, you really only need a little bit of the backstory. You don't need the whole thing. Uh, to inform me a piece, but I like kind of like wrote this guy. I really, really got to know this character uh, and seeing him like this, for, um, um, presenting him like this was something that uh, I took a lot of pride in. Um, so after graduation, I did an internship at the Hedema Group. Um, and then I um, got hired by them for a little under a year. And I was, um, I was blessed to be able to work on um, this galaxy crystal lobby 
um, project. And it's basically um, a lobby experience um, in Macau. And it's a gazebo that's made completely out of, well, not completely, like 95% out of crystal. Um, and it was a huge design challenge for me because I had gone from like concept and story and emotions and understanding these things. And they were just like, hey, we need you to do like some really, really architectural stuff. And I was like, oh my God, this is not what I'm here for. But I was working with the, the, one of the creative directors there, Stefan Lawrence, and he was just like a, an incredible mind. The dude was so smart. Um, he, knows, he knows music really well. And he also kind of like, he took me to the side when I was drawing things a little bit too structurally. And he said, I know that's what they want you to do, but they also just want you to sell it. Um, so he made me kind of steer my concepts to be a lot more emotive and a lot more fun and a lot more expressive. Um, whereas I was kind of nervous being in the workforce for the first time. And I thought I had to deliver something that was super clean and super polished and, and, um, and impress everyone. Um, I, I just felt like at that time I was impressing everyone for the wrong reasons. And he was just like, Hey, you could draw. I want to see what you think like. Um, and then after my time at the head of my group, I had done some freelance work, uh, a little bit of prop design for Nick on an unannounced project. Uh, but towards the end of that year, I believe that was the end of 2020. That's when I got my job at Rick and Morty, starting as a cleanup artist. Uh, but then I moved up to a background designer where I got to work uh, mainly on the, the season finale, which was a blessing, but, but was so hard. Um, it was kind of like a hard adjustment, um, adjustment period for me where I knew how to draw, but I didn't know how animation worked in this context. I didn't know how the production pipeline worked and I didn't know um, basically how I can draw best for everyone on my team. But my background lead Vance and Robbie, uh, my art director, they, they just kept throwing me assignments and kept challenging me to do better. And, uh, and I don't know, I'm kind of a stubborn person. Once I feel like I can't do something, it motivates me more to learn how to do it. Um, so it was like, they didn't really have to say much. They, even to this day, they kind of want me to chill out a little bit uh, with, with like kind of like how much I would do for a certain thing. Uh, but I'm just like, I just have to like turn out the best possible product that I can. Uh, so I had to uh, learn a lot and I think I adjusted pretty quickly because I went from cleanup to background designer with uh, pretty much within a month. And this is just more backgrounds from that episode. Um, uh, on the right, the, the piece on the right was a particular challenge because I had to do two poses uh, for a background. Uh, one where the door is closed and one where the door is open. Um, and it taught me a lot about layer management. When you work in background design um, for animation, the way you organize your files is super important. So if you're like the type of person that's just like, hey, I'm drawing everything on one file on one layer, or yo, I'm like just doing everything sporadically and not naming my layers, nothing's in groups. Uh, if you want to work in background design, you're going to need to uh, learn how to organize this stuff. Because when you pass that on to someone else, they're going to need to know where everything is and um, how everything is kind of working with each other. These are more shots from that final uh, episode. The right one I was super proud of because it took forever to do. Um, it was a pretty big background because I had to, we had to zoom in. I wish I had included, I, I kept the, the framing um, on this, but we had to zoom in from that window or zoom out from that window because that was the starting shot. So the left shot was where we started. And then we basically panned down from the top of that shot and then took that camera and zoomed out for the shot that's on the right. And camera movements and different and different types of things were a part of that learning curve. I mean, uh, not including just the style. And um, at Rick and Morty, I try my best to put in uh, Easter eggs wherever I can. Sometimes they don't get, uh, they don't get, uh, 
pushed all the way through because you have the art director who's just like, maybe this doesn't work. And they never really know when I'm like throwing something in there, but they'll like kind of like when it, during the note taking process, they'll just kind of like scratch something that was important to me. I was just like, dang. Uh, but for this shot in particular, I was able to keep a little bit of Miami in the shot um, because I couldn't completely change the house design. So it looked more like a house uh, from where I grew up. Uh, but I tried to keep it kind of like flat land and put in some palm trees um, and uh, some of the other types of trees that we have in Miami and the fences, the gates and stuff. And also um, anyone from Miami probably can recognize the, uh, the symbol on that track. Basically uh, the Miami-Dade County symbol uh, uh, redesigned uh, because I don't want Rick and Morty to get sued. <laughs> and I think I think that's it. Awesome. Thanks, Philip. So now no I think I uh, wanted to spend a couple minutes with you asking. I have a couple of questions and then we'll we'll open it up to the audience in, in just a bit. Um, no I think uh, it's funny. I, I actually uh, noted when you were talking about Easter eggs, I'm looking at that image right now. I'm like, I'm pretty sure the trash can is from like Dade County. They yeah. used to recruit in Miami. So I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's where he's going with it. So. It, it's cool you're able to, to throw some of the, the Easter eggs in there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they don't get all the way through, but you know, whatever works, works for me. Right, right. So, uh, so um, should I stop yeah, so let, let, Sure, sure, yeah. We can, okay. um, we can chat a little bit more as well. I thought um, we can chat about, uh, just to expand a little bit more on, on what you presented to us all, but I thought what, I, what was most curious is you know you spent time uh, at this at Dash you know really phenomenal high school and you were doing the industrial design route. I'm curious about how you made the connections from like industrial design and then going into entertainment. Like really, what pushed that? Because you obviously had a had a, a knack at industrial design and those skill sets, and you built that. But then you wanted to go the entertainment route. So I'm always curious, like where did you draw inspiration for just even anything related to designing within entertainment, like? What did you grow up watching? What, what got that bug in you that was just like, I think I want to go this route? So when I went to, so before I went to, to Dash, I wanted to be, I want to be a comic artist. I still uh, uh, want to pursue um, um, that career path, but that was like the, that was the dream for me at that time. The dream was just like, yo, I want to make comics. Um, I want to make cool uh, indie comics like, like Alan Moore, uh, and um, and I just knew that I had to draw a lot to work in comics, you know. Um, and so for me, I had picked the the major that was drawing the most, that was doing the most technical drawing, that was doing the most work, and and was going to build the best kind of like framework um, for for me to be successful. Because at that time. Um, everyone was like, there are people that went to Dash that had gone to like magnet art middle schools and they had known a lot of things that I had, I, they had known who Sargent was, they had known all these different artists and I didn't know who any of those people were. I didn't have any formal art education at all. Um, and so I was just like, it's not for me to play catch up. Um, and I just knew that it's just like, I need to draw, I need to be immersed in line work. And a lot of people that were in industrial design were doing illustrations and doing uh, more than just product design. They were doing, uh, they were doing, um, they were storytelling as well because Miss um, K required us to, to do illustrations along with our props. Um, so not only would you have to design your prop in like an isolated, like kind of like form, just the object, but you had to draw it in context. Uh, and that meant you had to have um, a certain level of Ill uh, illustrative skills. Um, and that was, kind of where that connection was drawn when I was seeing my upperclassmen um, and the work that she would have on the walls like I'd see uh, Van Andy Prevalis and Bomb laying on the walls and they had like some really really incredible illustrations and swebbing um, I was just like this is going to get me where I want to go I wasn't really like sold on industrial design at the time I still was into comics uh, but I knew that if I went down this path I could still I would still be able to make it in comics with the amount of skill that they had Eventually, I was just like, I think my junior year, I was almost sold on, I was almost completely sold on being in industrial design. But 
Then at the end of my junior year, I learned about entertainment design and that stole my heart completely. So, so for, I have to ask, you mentioned comics. So for any of the, the comic nerds in the audience, myself included, what were, what were some things that, you know, maybe gave you some inspiration as well growing up reading or? Um, I would say my big cousins put me onto a lot of Spawn, Tom McFarlane, Tom um, McFarlane yeah. um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, but my, I think my biggest inspiration, I mean, to follow this thread of like line art was manga. I read manga more than, than more than any comic. Uh, I guess save probably like X Men comics, uh, multiple different runs of X Men comics. I've like kind yeah. of like read a lot. Love Grant Morrison's work, um, but uh, manga was really where I was at, man. I was into Naruto. Um, I was into Dragon Ball, of course. Um, I was into um, Full Metal Alchemist. Um, those were some of the, the, the people that I was looking at. Um, Bleach actually was, was one of my biggest inspirations at the time because Tite Kubo has some of the, the, the greatest line work uh, uh, of that time, I'd say. Uh, so I'd say manga was really the, the, really the inspiration for me to, to pursue that. I always wanted to be a manga artist, um, but comics was our industry. Uh, and it's really cool to kind of see how not only the animation industry has changed uh, in response to the popularity of like uh, anime and uh, manga, but um, the comics industry has changed quite a bit to reflect uh, more of that style of drawing. Yeah, more in appreciation, I guess you can say too. Yeah, like Dan Mora, he's like an artist right now that's working on Power Rangers and Batman, who's like super influenced by uh, by um manga um but in his own way uh he still has a really kind of like deep and well-designed shadow shapes that we have over here but also the way like his character models are very much not what um jack kirby would be doing i'd say yeah yeah no so so uh so we talked a little bit about you know and you discussed it as well in, in depth your your kind of journey and trajectory uh throughout high school coming into art center I'm curious to to expand a little bit more about you know when you were at Art Center. I think it was really great to for you to share with us all your even just your 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 growth as an artist as a designer once you got to Art Center, taking us through some of your projects, and also just I'm sure you've noted it too, like seeing your your skill not just improve but also your way in which you were looking at things and taking influence from music or you know really expanding on that in areas. And it sounded like you really took a lot also from your faculty. So the question I always like to ask is, you know, what, who were either some of your standout faculty for you? I know you mentioned a couple or any specific courses uh, that, you know, really, if you think about your art center experience, they were like, yep, those were my, either my go-to faculty or those were my, uh, those were my, like my top classes that really, you know, push me to the next level. I would say, great question. Uh, there are so many like great teachers in uh, entertainment design. Um, or it's like I'll, I'll, just along the way, I've met so many like uh, cool people that um, that really really helped me understand design in a different way. That that my first design process teacher, Hao Wu, he's the one that kind of broke the mold and, and made me understand um, the Hao Wu and Thomas. I'd say Hao Wu and Thomas because they they taught uh, DP one at that time. Um, they really made me understand kind of like emotion instead of function. Um, or it would probably be like 80-20, 80% uh, emotion, 20% function. Um, Eric Ng was a hugely in, uh, influential uh, instructor. Um, I guess and also Thomas Burtling from that class, but I think I had spent more time with Eric Ng because uh, not only did I take uh, my advanced perspective class with him and my BizCom 2 class with him, but I also took entertainment sketchbook with him. And then I ended up um, um, TA for um, for entertainment sketchbook. Um, so Eric Ng was like a huge influence. Um, it makes sense because his line work is incredible. And then I was just like, I, I need to have this level of line quality. Uh, and he was also one of the teachers that was just was was really, really tough on you. Uh, anybody can get a test. Everyone, anyone who's taken an Eric Ng class can attest to how, uh, how tough his classes are and how, how um, how tough he's going to be on you and how much he's going to push you. Um, um, 
I think Fernanda was a great teacher um, for my last uh, my last term. Um, and Richard Keyes was an amazing instructor. Um, and um, if I can talk a little bit outside of art, but, uh, but Nancy yeah. Graystone uh, was, um, I, I think I took like three different writing classes with her. And um, I think she helped me understand how to summarize stories. So I wasn't kind of like um, rambling to my teachers uh, because I was taking certain classes and I really, really got into storytelling uh, and writing and screenwriting. Um, um, for a certain amount of time at arts, probably for probably the first three, my first three years at arts, and I was really, really into screenwriting and filmmaking in general. Um, but I was kind of like writing my entire story and trying to pitch my entire story to my teachers in class. They're just like, I just want to, I just want to know what the vehicle does and why you designed the vehicle like that. And I'm just like, but did you know this vehicle was made back in such and such and such time? And then I had to break it apart. And then this guy wrote it and blah, blah, blah. blah. And they're just like, no, no one cares about that. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, man. Uh, and no, she, I, think, I think it's a good, a good skill set to synthesize. And, you know, at the end of the day, you're a storyteller who's designing. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to kind of pull back a little bit and yeah, of course. Uh, no, yeah, definitely. She told me, she basically, taught me how to write log lines and taught me how to summarize uh, what I was saying a little bit. Were there any, were there any, so we, we talked about, you know, standout faculty courses, were, was there anything surprising during your journey at Art Center that, you know, as you, as you embarked on your journey at Art Center, you know, came from Miami, you're, you're, you know, Pasadena, LA area now, was there anything throughout that journey of four years where you were just like, wow, I didn't really, I didn't, you know, Coming into it, I didn't think I was going to do that. And this could be anything, really. But was there anything that stands out for you during that time at Art Center where you're like, I didn't expect myself to do that, but I did it? Yes. <laughs> A big yes. So for our first two or three terms, uh, we learned like how to fabricate. Uh, so we spent a lot of uh, time in the model shop. Uh, and I think it was either my second term or my third term, uh, we had to like, build a clay, build, sculpt, paint a clay helmet. Um, and the theme, my theme was Star Wars, but we had to build, uh, um, uh, sculpt and paint a, a clay helmet. And working up to that, we learned a bunch of different fabrication skills and we had to work into the, work in the shop um, and learn how to use a lot of the different machines in there. And I'm just like, I'm here to draw. <laughs> I was there to draw, but I had to, they had us like learn a lot of fabrication skills um, and it really, really surprised me. And I, at the time, I was just like, why am I doing this? But when we, when we got to the helmet class, when all of those like kind of like um, study models class and, and, and things like that uh, in my first two terms led to the helmet, I felt really rewarded. Um, um, and I felt really proud that I did that because it's something that I had never, never thought I, I never thought I would ever do that. And I never thought I'd ever be able to do something like that. Um, and it kind of opened my mind to the possibilities that it's just like, what we're learning at Art Center is not how to draw, we're learning how to learn. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have a, a, one more question, then I want to turn it over to my colleague Jennifer in the library. She has a question for you as well. But my question is, and I'm sure you can't share details with us, but is there anything fun exciting that you're working on related to Rick and Morty that we should be uh, you know aware of on the lookout for coming up uh season six season six is season six soon. yeah yeah that's that's what we got coming and season six that, that's all you good. can talk about the season yeah. six is coming <laughs> yeah I mean a lot more Rick and Morty is coming but season six is what's yeah. coming and you know what I can say <laughs> great uh Jennifer I wanted to throw it over to you I know you had a question uh for Philip as well yeah thank you Tim um, Philip, uh, since you worked in the library, you were familiar with all of the great resources that the library provides to students. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how you use the library resources for your class assignments and or your personal projects? Yes, of course. Uh, the library is really my favorite place in the school. Um, it, and I spent a lot of time just working there because it's also, it, I mean, aside from being kind of like um, um, a resource for text, 
Uh, it's also a place where you can kind of like work in a quiet space. Uh, so if I needed to stay on campus to work on something, or if I wanted to stay on campus to work on something, I'd work in the library. Um, because not only is it a quiet space where I can focus and get things done, but any any references that I would need in terms of like if I need to do historical reference for architecture or costume, the library library would have that. If I need to expand my knowledge of how like cameras work, the library would have a lot of filmmaking and kind of like storyboarding books. And if I just want to read comic books, the, the library has those comic books too, uh, and they have some of the best. Um, but it's just, I mean, generally speaking, I don't think you're going to find and I didn't slash haven't found um, as a, a, a resource for art text and art instruction uh, that's as extensive as the library anywhere else. Like there's no other library that's gonna have as many books on art, making of books, um, 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 his, like kind of like artist biographies, philosophy books, art magazines that aren't even in circulation anymore. Uh, nowhere else, you are not going to find that anywhere else. And in a library, it kind of like opened my mind when I saw kind of like periodicals about comics. You know, it's like I was already interested in comics, interested in reading comics, but I didn't know there are people that were like writing magazines on and critiquing comics and critical th comic like theory almost, sequential art theory. Um, and it just kind of like opened my mind to even more possibilities because it would have things I wouldn't even dream of being able to learn from, you know? Sometimes you don't know what you're looking for until you find it in a library. It's a great place to find that thing you may not be looking for. Great, well, I think this is the uh, the opportunity now for the q and I know there's tons, I was looking at the chat, tons of questions were coming in. So I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to my colleague, Stephen from Center for DEI and he'll moderate the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. I know there's always a ton of questions and limited time, so we'll we'll get through them speed round. Steven. All right, awesome. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. Um, we already have a few coming in, so uh, let's see. Uh, let's see, um, I'll just ask you to unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, Ahmed, are you still here? Okay, all right. Um, Ahmed asked, when you get a brief for an environment concept design job or for any design problem, how do you make it mostly advanced and, and familiar in the same time like Star Wars, not like Transformers as it is not familiar to the audience? It's most, most acceptable, acceptable yet. So I'm, I'm guessing, um, how do you differentiate and how do you make something in advanced but also familiar at the same time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's what it is. Yeah, just in the question. Yeah. Um, I would say take everyday objects and then kind of like put it in different contexts, you know, have someone, I don't know, um, take take a lamp or the top of a lamp and then see how it will look if you try to turn it into a bowl. Um, um, see how a mouse would look in the spaceship. See how... Um, a table will look at the car like take things that are familiar and just change the context in which you see them and then design on top of that and i think that's an easy way for you to create something that like feels very very original uh and familiar at the same time and that can work for anything that doesn't have to work for like advanced um science fiction or anything like that you can do high fantasy stuff like that you know uh there's this really cool comic name which had Ataye, um where there's a character in it uh who's supposed to be a in a wheelchair, but the wheelchair is is basically like goat legs. So it's just like a mixture between a centaur and someone uh, uh, and someone that's uh, that's supposed to be in a wheelchair. Um, and that's probably the most original takes on that that I've ever seen in my life. Uh, and it's simple. It's not anything that's super complex. So I would say just switching up the context of familiar things. Yeah, great. I think it's a great answer. Yeah, always keeping it, not always keep it simple, but simple sometimes is is, is better. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, let's move on. Uh, I saw someone's hand raised. I think it was Maria. Maria, are you still here? Do you still have a question you'd love to ask? Uh, uh, yes, hi. I'm still here. Hi, Philip. Um, hey, hey. Actually, my original question was taken by Jennifer. I just was curious if the library was an incubation zone for you. Um, but I guess I do have another one. Um, you show such breadth 
of references. Um, and it sounds like you had so many periods in your life where you focused on one skill set and maneuvered to another one. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about what what you would advise future students of Art Center? What can they do during their time at Art Center to cultivate that kind of thing? Um, the ability to to cross-reference Ninja Turtles with Renoir and how would they cultivate that and music? Um, I would say one of the things that I did, I mean, one, you could spend a lot of time in the library and just kind of like coast around. Don't, I mean, you can go looking for one thing because, but it's, I, I promise you, you're gonna go looking for that art of book or whatever, and you're gonna end up like 10 different books in your hand. Uh, because before you find it, you're going to find a bunch of different books that are cool to you. Um, but also open, keep your mind open to the value of your different majors, you know. Um, it's like you can learn so much and apply so much from the different majors that are like that are at Art, that are at art Center. Um, and it can really elevate your thinking when it comes to design and elevate your thinking when it comes to like art in general. It's just like there's so much you can learn about composition from photography. And, and it sounds obvious, but it's it's something that I don't think uh, enough people like uh, do. Just go to the student gallery. If you're at Art Center and you're working on campus, go to the student gallery and just kind of like walk around and see what other departments are doing. Uh, see like maybe how you can use like a palette or a visual that that you are inspired by in someone's product uh, product design work or use the layout that you see and and like someone's graphic design work and like and inform your own work um really really kind of lean on your peers and lean on, lean on your contemporaries you know thank you yeah no problem great answer um let's see who else is in here in this chat um nco would you like to ask your question i hope i'm pronouncing that correctly all right i will ask for them. Uh, <laughs> what was the hardest thing to do while drawing the background other than what the director pushed you to do? Uh, style. I would say um, matching style was one of the, the hardest parts, like kind of like um, starting out. Um, making sure like it, you're going to get gain a lot of like technical skill over your time, uh, um, over your art journeys. Um, over everyone's individual art journeys because everyone's searching for technical skill. You're going to learn how to draw the neoclassical like architecture. You're going to learn how to draw all the, the complex Gothic cathedral. You know, you're going to you're going to get there. Um, but as a professional artist, you also need to learn how to draw that thing in the context of the world that you're drawing it for. Uh, and for Rick and Morty, it's it's kind of a weird show where things are realistic but also stylized in a very very nuanced way uh and just nailing that style and getting to a point where i was confident nailing that style was one of the hardest things um so yeah i think style cool and it's your know, style in relation to the the work that you're doing not your own personal style yes, right? yes yeah yes. yeah uh jm uh can you please answer your question or ask your question hello uh yeah so I think for me, um, the biggest thing is I'm, I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to be going in the future. So I'm looking towards like, what are some realistic types of jobs or goals that you would be looking for after you graduate, right? So let's say you go through the animation program or the concept um, program. Mm -hmm. um, what is like a realistic expectation of what job should I be looking to apply to? And then in those job positions, what what would you actually be doing, right? Like what 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 would those look like once you're actually in those job positions? Um, great question. I don't know if I can answer kind of like the full range of of the possibilities of, of what the, the the details of the possibilities of what you would be doing. It's just a lot of different disciplines, um, but. Um, I'll say it, you should apply everywhere you want to work. Uh, just apply. It's like, don't look for, um, I wouldn't say the trying to sell yourself short or try to look for like, like what's super realistic. I would say apply where in the, to the roles that you would want to be doing, you know, 
It's like, if you see yourself as um, a background designer, then apply for background design gigs. Don't, don't like look for like, I don't know, like PA and then try to get into background design. It's like apply for background design. Um, if you want to be a character designer, apply for character design gigs. Um, um, but I can speak to background design for TV animation in terms of what you would be doing. Or I guess in production roles in general, you're going to be doing a lot of work that kind of has to be seen on screen and has to be replicated. Um, and I think one of the greatest skills that you can have like in these contexts is being able to draw for a team, being able to make sure that the way you're drawing and the, the, um, the way you're organizing your files, like I was saying earlier, um, is going to be beneficial for someone else to take it without you being able to talk to them. If you can give someone your work or your file and they can understand it, they can understand how wide this cabinet is, um, how tall this mirror is, how tall this door is, you know, make sure you gain the skills to be, to, to visually communicate what you're trying to say. Um, and that's going to be one of the most important things. Thank you for that. Um, so there's a few more. I'm just going to try to run through these as quick as possible because I know we're running out of time. So uh, let's see. This is Demi. Demi's question. Uh, hi, you said you were grinding with your sketchbooks. Could you expand on what you were making in them? I was, I was drawing everything. I was drawing like anything that I could find to draw. Like um, Arts and Roll these like figure drawing classes. Um, and I'm pretty sure they still do. Um, um, post uh, um, night figure drawing so and you really it's really hard to find that without trying to spend like twenty dollars or fifteen bucks. Uh, so I'd go to those figure drawing classes and they'd be for five hours and usually people would go in uh, for an hour, uh, two hours and dip out, just like come in and chill, draw and hang out. I would go to those. I think I took a term off through the summer. Or I had to take a term off because at the time entertainment design uh, didn't have any any summer terms. Um, so I had to take a term off in that entire summer, I would go like almost every day that it was like um, that they were hosting it. Um, or I would go like every Friday that they were hosting it or something like that. So like once a week, uh, and I would stay the whole five hours just drawing figures. Um, or I'd go outside and do some plain air drawing. I do master copies. And usually the way that I, I study like books, like a figure drawing instructional book is I draw every object in them it's not a very efficient way uh to to study a thing uh but at that time i was like if i'm going through like a michael hampton like figure drawing uh, book i'm going to draw everything that he drew because i had this thing that i'm not going to get to where they are if i don't get the mileage that they have uh, you know so i would have to in my head i would have to draw everything that they drew um as a start <laughs> That's right. It's, it's, it's 10,000 hours, right? But for each yeah. you know, thing you're trying to do. Um, exactly. Yeah. And uh, that sort of leads into the next question from L. Uh, they're asking, how would you recommend getting better at figure drawing uh, re realistic shapes, especially as someone who wants to go into concept art? Um, I would say the, the way that works for me to learn how to draw anything, um, including figures, is to draw it slow and draw it fast. Uh, so what that means is basically you want to do, you want to time yourself when you draw, you want to make sure you have like a sense of like, kind of like how long it takes you to do different kind of like levels of finishes um, um, and how that's going to affect how you're drawing. So if you have 10 seconds to draw a thing, you're going to draw it very differently. You're going to start very differently than if you had two hours to draw that same thing. Uh, if you have two hours, you're going to be like, okay, I need to do the underdrawing, I need to fill up the structure, I need to draw through the form, I need to do all this stuff. If you have 10 seconds, you just kind of like land it in, drawing it fast and scribbling and trying to give the impression of a thing. But what that does is it gives you kind of like an overall sense of what it is, whereas when you have more time to spend on it, you get to know the nuances of what it is. So I would say when you're drawing figures, gesture draw. Um, draw with charcoal value, draw with any material you want, you can draw with, anything you can get your hands on, uh, but also draw with different at different timings. So it's just like, if you find yourself only, only doing one hour studies for figures, you need to start doing some five minute studies. You need to start doing some five minute studies and then you can balance it off again with some one hour studies. Yeah, that's cool. I never thought about that, but the timing aspect of it, of what you can get done in that time period and then how that affects your skill set. That's really, that's really cool. Um, 
Uh, Tim, we have some time for some more or? Yeah, I think I was also just going to give some general uh, responses. I know there was a okay. couple of questions, which I assume were from uh, potentially prospective applicants. You're asking about like improving skills and whatnot. So I dropped a couple links in the chat. One is uh, any of us in admissions are more than happy to connect with a prospective student who's either curious about the programs we offer, portfolio requirements, do I do illustration versus entertainment design? Um, how do I build my skill set? So we have appointments that are free available to you. We do those virtually and some select in person. Um, so there's that. Uh, also wanted to just reiterate uh, to Philip's point, like anybody, I know there's a question that came in from Christian Gutierrez asking about, you know, only having access to figure drawing from models online. So one of the things I, I, I speak uh, speak about uh, frequently to prospective students is we understand, especially right now with the ongoing pandemic, not everybody has access to the same type of resources. So if you're really only able at the moment to get, you know, figure drawing practice from like online tutorials, I think, you know, that's better than nothing. I always encourage students stay away from books. Books give you a different type of perspective. Um, but, you know, yeah, if you can do in person, that's always great. You know, online video tutorials is awesome. If you're able and you feel comfortable and safe doing so, you know, go to your local coffee shop, sit down, bring out your sketchbook and draw from life. You know, observe people, draw people. If you live by a local zoo, take a trip to the zoo, you know, get some, <laughs> you know, get some, uh, some exercise in as well. But really, you're able just to like draw from observation from life draw some animals. I mean, just living in your sketchbook. You know, there was a question earlier about a sketchbook. Um, I mean, from someone who's reviewing applications and, and plenty of them, sketchbooks always go a long way to really just kind of see how you're kind of kind of going for it. And uh, sketchbooks are fun because it's not something that's class instructed. It's 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 really personal to you. And we love to see those. But yeah, those are some of my my uh, my tips there. And then uh, lastly, if you're curious about learning more about uh, uh, about some of our other alumni as well. We'll continue this series again in March and in April. So there's a link in there for prospective students to register. Current students and Art Center community members uh, don't register through that link. That's only for prospective students. Um, anyone from the Art Center community, including current students, will send out email invites in the coming weeks so you can register for that. But I think that about does it on, on time. Any any final uh, thoughts and questions? I want to uh, thank uh, Stephen from Center for DI, Jennifer, and our colleagues in the library as well, as well as the, the Entertainment Design Department for collaborating and co-sponsoring this event. But most of all, thank you to Philip Burroughs Jr. for being with us, uh, sharing his phenomenal journey to Art Center and um, you know, the amazing things that he's doing right now uh, with, uh, with Rick and Morty. But any final, any final words, Philip, for us? Uh, I want to say thank you, thank you guys for the opportunity to kind of like speak and uh, and uh, you guys showcasing me and of course thank you to the library for um, just providing that resource but also like providing a job for me while I was going through college and being uh, such a cool kind of like uh, community of people uh, and thank you guys for thinking about me uh, to to do this and thank everyone that came out here to to see me talk and, and ramble and things like that. Of course. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Stephen, Jennifer, all of my colleagues at Art Center. And thank you to all of you for tuning in. And I'm sure we'll see you at the next one. Uh, in March, we'll focus on uh, someone from Sony Animation Pictures and in April from Lucasfilm Animation, aka Star Wars. So be on the lookout for those invites and we'll see you at the next one. Thanks again, everyone. Take care. See you guys. Peace.